before that, I'd like to hand- This meeting is being uh, recorded. Uh, oh, yep, thank you for recording this. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to uh, reintroduce Eric Schultz. And if you, he's going to be the moderator and then he'll hand it off to the other two to introduce themselves. So Eric, take it away. Uh, thank you, Randy. And you know, it's fun being the moderator. And usually the moderator is really the old guy who really isn't relevant at anything anymore, but we'll try to introduce the ones that really have the brains, meaning Rex Wallace and Sean. Uh, uh, so Randy, uh, to you and your co-chair of this work group and certainly Charles Steller and everyone at Weedy, it's a great organization. I know we at Sidious Tech are proud to be members of it. You do great work, um, keep up that great work and thanks very much for hosting this today. Why don't we do this? Uh, let me just, uh, if I may, do a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Um, if we can ask everyone to put their uh, Zoom uh, on mute, that would be great. Uh, what we will try to do, but we're not gonna be so hard at it. It's not a huge group, but uh, we'll uh, leave time at the end for Q and A. But if questions come up, please raise your hand and happy to provide any information that we can. Um, and what we've got here today are four questions related to the topic of member experience, retention, and growth. Uh, we'll go through those, and Rex and Sham will make their comments from their um, uh, standpoint. And uh, given that, why don't we ask uh, Rex and Sham to introduce themselves? We'll start with Rex, uh, if you want to give your intro. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, my name is Rex Wallace. I lead a um, consulting firm focused on Medicare star ratings, um, yep, you know, been in the healthcare space for, you know, 27 ish years, um, working for plans and, and, uh, and consulting firms, et cetera. Um, so, um, I am completely focused on, you know, Medicare plans right now. So, um, kind of everything that I do is through the lens of star ratings, so quality improvement, you know, focused on improving, uh, increasing revenue for, for Medicare plans. And that lends to a lot of um, member experience and provider engagement and, you know, work around all the kind of matrix partners within a, within a health plan. Um, but yeah, this is my first time at Weedy, so super happy to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Great. Thanks, Rex. So you're our star today, right? <laughs> yeah, another bad one. <laughs> Quickly moving to my colleague, Sean. Thanks, Eric. Uh, uh, so, uh, so my first reaction on looking at the slide is my photograph looks about ten years younger than me. <laughs> uh, I should I should take a recent uh, mug shot and put that over there. But that's uh, that's something that I'll work on after this. But uh, uh, to the VD team, uh, thanks for hosting me. Thanks for inviting. Thanks for the opportunity to talk over here. And um, a quick uh, uh, background of myself. Uh, uh, the name is uh, Sham Karnakaran. I, I run uh, about a third of uh, Sirius Tech, essentially uh, uh, run the business of uh, uh, working with our uh, health plan payer customers. Uh, 20, 25 odd years in healthcare, predominantly health tech for payers, a little bit of providers and a little bit of uh, pharma and life sciences experiences baked into that as well. My uh, uh, focus areas uh, uh, fairly aligned with what Rex mentioned, uh, quality, value-based care, um, interop, uh, uh, and uh, uh, data and analytics, uh, uh, and uh, personalization, member experience, and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the key themes that I would be talking about is uh, 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 a level of fungibility and convergence that is happening in the health plan world where all of these topics that we have uh, traditionally looked at uh, in uh, different uh, silos is kind of coming together. And uh, that's one of the key things uh, that uh, at least uh, we'll be talking about today. But uh, to do, before I get into that, let me just pass it back to Eric uh, uh, to take it forward. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Rex. Um, and so glad to have you both here today and quick uh, background on me. I'm Eric Schultz. Uh, I currently serve as president of Fluid Edge Consulting, which is a wholly owned consulting firm of Sidious Tech. Uh, Fluid Edge Consulting is about 150 consultants and um, our space of expertise is around health plans and life sciences in particular. And we're the consulting arm of Sidious Tech 
and our claim to fame, as I would call it, is that what we bring are uh, individuals who have been in your shoes in the technical business aspects of health plans over the years and are now working on the consulting side to help address uh, strategy and solution selection and technology selection, implementation, all of that good stuff. Uh, before that, I was CEO of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare up in New England, and prior to that, CEO of Fallon Community Health Plan and Integrated Delivery Care Network, uh, also in Massachusetts. And um, we're gonna get going, uh, but just a couple of reflections. When I was CEO most recently at Harvard Pilgrim, um, we long recognized the importance of engaging our members. Um, uh, Harvard Pilgrim, I was proud to say, was the health plan in America, selected the number one health plan in America 10 years in a row. And people used to ask me, hey, Schultz, how did you guys do it? And, and actually, there was no magic. It was doing the basics well every single day. And that means answering the telephones, responding to emails, and trying to be as consistent as we can with our members and the providers and everyone else that we touch. And so it's just doing the basics well. And I remember also, um, and for many years, uh, really the health plan industry and, and now even the payer, uh, the provider industry that's getting into value-based contract and risk management, we invested a lot of money, particularly in the area of care management. I think that was one of the first forays where we entered digital um, aspects of member engagement. And I'll tell you, and actually in many respects to this day, there was a lot of money spent on it and not a lot of ROI. Um, it was partly a me too, every health plan had to have, had to have care management programs um, in order to sell their products. But you know, there were a lot of email reminder cards that would go out, telephone calls that would be made, but it didn't make a solid dent. We still have the same 5% of our membership driving 50% of the cost, if not more. Um, and so it was hard to find the ROI. But now as I look at where health plans are and payers in general, um, we've made a lot of advancements in the area of uh, having access to good data. Certainly interoperability has made some major inroads there. We've got uh, advanced analytics that are impressive and we certainly have tons of digital solutions. So my take is, as I speak to my fellow colleagues in the payer world, is that there's a lot of excitement and interest uh, to move forward in this space. There's also a lot of um, consternation because you know wanting to get the right return on investment is always going to be there. And and you know from our perspective as a payer CEO, what are we going to do to help retain that member? Uh, what are we going to do to help retain those members that we never have a chance to touch who are healthy, young, or otherwise, and not just those that we're working with uh, from a, um, a standpoint of someone who has an illness? Um, how are we going to connect with our providers better? Because most of us in the business believe that good relationships with our providers makes a difference. Um, so anyway, we've got two great people here to make some comments. I'll pepper some in here and there. Um, and uh, Randy, if you'd go, oh, you're already up on the first slide. So um, four questions, as I mentioned. First one is kind of, let's set the baseline here. And I'm gonna ask Rex if he would go first, but what are the key priorities and challenges for health plans today as you see them, Rex? Yeah, and, and <clears throat> thanks, Eric. And again, kind of with that lens of um, Medicare, which should, uh, you know, I would think kind of, cascade across all lines of business right but um you know if i'm if i'm sitting in the shoes of a, of a health plan leader today i mean my my top priorities are around it's really around the member experience and you know that's that's fed through the impact that it, that it's um having that's growing in star ratings right so stars are you know if you're a medicare plan pivotal to, to being competitive you can't be competitive if you're not performing well in stars and you know it's um, we just finished the 2022 star ratings a couple of months ago they came out and the numbers changed dramatically right um, I mean plans 
the, the year before we had, you know, less than less than just under 50% of plans um, achieved four stars or higher. And this year, 68%, I think, achieved four stars or higher. Right? So, so 20% more plans are in the money. If you're above four stars, you get the quality bonus payments. And, you know, and, and some of the priorities right now as they're going through bid season is how, how do we how do we spend this quality bonus payment and rebate revenue that we didn't have last year? And, and I think, you know, a word of caution to, to all of those plans that are getting it for the first time or haven't had it in a while and they're, they're newly getting it this year. Um, and many of them earned it. Many of them performed very well, but, but many of them were gifted it. Um, you know, it was a, a result of the, the COVID relief that CMS implemented for the 2022 stars, um, allowing plans to receive the higher of you know, two different years in almost every measure. Um, so the word of caution is, and if I'm sitting in the shoes of, of a health plan leader, leader going through the bid strategy sessions right now is, is what if I don't have that money next year? You know, how, how do I spend that money or invest that money this year and get long-term value from it without um, at least recognizing the risk that I might not get it next year? COVID relief as it appeared in 2022 stars, it does not appear in 23 stars. It, it, there will be very minimal relief and it will not result in, um, you know, almost 70% of plans being four stars. It'll be closer to 50%, we think. So, um, you know, that's a huge priority is how do we invest the, the, the money that we've gotten? Plus, you know, we have many, many more five-star plans now. We had 21 last year, we have 74 now. 21 was the most we'd ever had up until last year. Now we have 74, so more than triple. That number will not sustain either. And next year, we expect to have 20-ish five-star plans again. So, you know, these 50-ish plans that got five stars this year are able to leverage year-round marketing for, for this one year. And, and, and if I'm a five-star plan, that's a huge priority for me. How do I, how do I take advantage of this? How do I leverage it? On the flip side, if I'm you know, I'm very, very likely a plan under five stars, but I have a five star competitor in my backyard for the first time ever because, you know, we went from having under 600 counties where there was a five star plan last year to having over 1,650 counties this year with a five star plan. So mm. there, there will be much more movement. Members will move more this year. They will leave non five star plans to go to five star plans more than we've ever seen before, we, we, we believe that. So how do the, the, the new five-star plans take advantage of that? How do the non-five-star plans defend against that? I mean, that's a, that's a key strategy that, that, is, that we need to be talking about right now because you know, that five-star special enrollment period is underway as we speak and it lasts all the way through November 30th, which extends well beyond OEP, the open enrollment period into the lock-in period where most Medicare plans can't grow, but these Fox star plans can grow. So that's, that's, that's a few things that are top of mind for me if I'm a health plan leader today. Thanks, Rex. Let's move it over to you, Sean. Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, first of all, great question and a loaded one at that. I'm going to try and answer that uh, in a slightly loaded fashion as well. So, uh, uh, so Rex, uh, thanks for the summary on uh, stars and the impact of member experience. I think all great points. Uh, I'm going to take a step back and uh, try and answer this question in a slightly different fashion. Uh, so um, if I look at, uh, or if you talk to anybody in the healthcare ecosystem, uh, I believe there is consensus that uh, uh, the next decade is a decade for transformation amongst uh, uh, and uh, uh, amongst a variety of different things in healthcare across hospitals, plants, and uh, uh, adjacencies, and uh, so on. And transformation means uh, different things for different uh, uh, people, different individuals that you talk to. In our mind, uh, uh, there are many trends, many challenges, many priorities that uh, healthcare organizations, specifically payers, are uh, faced with. Uh, and uh, typically speaking in any industry, positive disruption happens when there is a convergence of uh, many of these trends. So we've seen that in the mobile world, we've seen that in the, the digital camera space, we've seen that in the uh, uh, 
uh, battery electric vehicle space and so on and so forth. We are seeing that. Uh, in healthcare, uh, there are three broad, three broad spectrum. Uh, one is uh, regulatory, and there are many focused initiatives that uh, 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 that uh, comes under the bracket of uh, regulatory interventions. So Medicare Star is an important one, uh, Rex, that you mentioned. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, price transparency, surprise billing, and similar initiatives. Uh, uh, two years from now, uh, the entire data for uh, pricing and everything is going to be publicly available. And then what happens then? Similar to what is happening on the star rating side of things. Uh, there, are, uh, there are business models that are being evaluated with the advent of uh, new digital health companies and so on and so forth. And then there are technology challenges as well. Uh, uh, there is uh, there is fire AI ML analytics uh, uh, a whole suite of tools that are being made available to healthcare uh, practitioners as we speak. Uh, but all of that I think uh, um, uh, boils down to uh, or points to one uh, main priority for uh, healthcare organizations in general and specifically for health plans, which is uh, essentially competitive positioning. So, um, so who do you compete with today? Uh, and how do you uh, traditionally health plans have looked at uh, uh, regional performance market share as the, uh, to drive pricing premiums and economies of scale as a way to uh, position themselves competitively. And today, uh, just by virtue of what has been happening for the last 10 years, uh, uh, introduction of data, uh, uh, patient-related data, liberation of data, uh, the new digital health tech companies that are vying for competitive positioning is, uh, uh, is capturing, gathering um, uh, uh, data, assimilating data, interrogating data, and then trying to make value out of it, driving personalization, consumerization, and so on and so forth. So in a, in a broad uh, perspective, I think that is probably one of the premium priorities that uh, most health plans are looking at. And then there are a bunch of other initiatives, regulatory, business-wise, and technology-wise, that uh, uh, at a slightly more tactical operational level that we need to address on a go-forward basis. Sean, what would you say is one of the bigger challenges that your customers, your health plan customers, are facing? Uh, so uh, again, so just besides going back, cost of the uh, solutions. <laughs> so I think uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you a very uh, simple example, Eric. Uh, the notion of value-based care and contracts have been in existence for uh, a while, uh, and a very simple uh, uh, definition of a value-based contract may be related to your uh, diabetic patients and how they are performing. And I will, I will let Rex talk at length about the, uh, the variances over here, but uh, a very simple construct between a payer and a provider entity is perhaps a, a, a contract centered around the performance of uh, their diabetic population. Now, the discrepancies in healthcare, the misalignment is how do you define the diabetic population? Uh, the definitions are uh, different on the health plan side of things. The definitions are different on the provider side of things. Uh, uh, whether you use pre-screening codes, whether you use your own internal evidence-based guidelines. When it comes to uh, the detailed implementation, those are the contractual level discrepancies that needs to get resolved. Uh, the challenges uh, in addition to that is at data level. Health plans typically are trying to get in EHR data. Uh, holistic data of the members across the uh, care spectrum. Uh, that is a work in progress. The maturity of that is evolving. Uh, providers today have to get data from health plans. So there is a little bit of a trust uh, establishment that needs to happen over there because the measurement of the uh, contract is uh, on the basis of that. Uh, the third thing is there is workflow and the reporting misalignment. One of the providers that I was uh, uh, talking to uh, used to receive uh, about 150 odd uh, similar reports. And I use the word similar, not same, <laughs> because it's it's largely there, but it's not the same. So you really have to go through each of the reports. Yeah. So how do you bring that alignment? So those are, uh, in that yeah. specific context, in the context of value-based care, those are some of the 
uh, detailed level challenges uh, that we have to resolve as a uh, as an ecosystem because there is a, a, a multiple different uh, uh, players and dimensions involved in this. Yeah. And, so Rex, do you, do you align with what Sham is just saying or what would you add? Do you have any brief additions to add before we go to the next? I mean, yeah, I would just add on, but I definitely agree with what, what, what he was saying. I mean, the whole, I mean, especially from a star standpoint, the value base, you know, the, the, the contracts and the management is so, so key. I, I think, you know, if you ask me what the biggest problem some of my clients are facing right now, at least that I'm involved in, you know, are they're, they're, they're around things like disenrollment, right? Like they're, I think we saw, we saw, um, we haven't seen all the data yet. I haven't seen all the data yet, but, but I know some, you know, some of the big plans and, and, and a bunch of the other plans did, did lose a lot more members than they expected. There was a lot more movement during AEP than, than I think many of us expected, which I think will carry on into, into the five-star SCP, like I was saying earlier. But but I think the fact that um, it's just got so many ramifications, right? When you're when you're losing members, not only are you losing the revenue tied to it, but you're being penalized from a star's standpoint more so than you ever have before, because all of these member experience weights, including voluntary disenrollment has risen to a weight of four, it's, it's, it's more important from a star standpoint for a health plan to retain a member or to, or just to ensure that member has a positive customer service experience right. than, than to manage their blood sugar if they're diabetic. It's more yep. important, from it's, it's heavier weighted from a star standpoint to manage the experience than it is to manage the clinical outcome. With the thought that if you do that, if you improve the experience, you're going to have a better clinical outcome. Members are going to be more compliant more adherent. So, so, you know, managing those experience measures, including disenrollment, um, and these are measures where you don't have denominators, like a HEDIS measure, right? You, you don't know who's going to fill out a CAP survey. You don't know who's going to disenroll. Um, it presents a whole new challenge and they're weighted heavier than everything else. So that's, yeah. that's definitely top of mind and the, the biggest problem some of my clients are facing. Yeah. And when you think about how much money a health plan spends, just to initially enroll a member, a Medicare Advantage member, and get that person enrolled. I mean, it's huge, you know, and then to lose it, you really need to keep that member. I forgot what the ratio, it's changed, but a number of years before you can offset the initial investment of uh, attracting that member. So there's a lot of facets to that. I agree, Rex. And if you... Right. If you've done a good job, if you've done a good job of coding for risk adjustment, right, and all of these other things, and in addressing stars gaps, and then it all kind of goes out the window, right, when you yeah. when you lose that yeah. member, and benefits to your competitor who 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 gets them, all of your great diagnosis coding, education, right, yeah. um, all benefits the next the next payer. Uh, so this leads in well for our next question, I think, and I'm going to turn to you, Sean, first, but. Um, with evidence-based whole healthcare gaps as a focus, how can payers and providers align? How can we work together to identify and address these many care gaps that are out there? Sure. I kind of uh, touched upon this briefly, but uh, essentially the way we look at it is uh, uh, the definition of a care gap and its importance is in three different layers. Right? One, uh, the, the uh, the most basic layer is care gaps uh, that traditionally health plans have uh, looked at care gaps is for regulatory compliance, which is a HERA score or a state specific measure and scoring and rating against that, uh, which has largely been the focus accreditation and um, uh, similar initiatives. Uh, the next step, which is uh, the evolving step is how do you use care gaps as part of uh, sharing uh, uh, the measurement criteria with your provider partners, which is what we are seeing under provider engagement, uh, bringing uh, the value-based contract ecosystem into play and uh, all the initiatives around risk sharing uh, and uh, similar. Uh, that is the second layer. Uh, uh, again, different organizations are at different levels of maturity, uh, provider engagement being the ultimate goal. Uh, and then finally, the destination of where the, we think care gaps is going towards, and uh, I think the industry and regulatory focus is all moving towards is member experience or personalization, which is how can you deliver uh, differentiated, personalized care or medicine or options 
to your membership based off of uh, your understanding of their care gaps. So if there is a diabetes population, then you have five different digital assets that you want that member to be making use of. Can you then create personalization at a benefit level for that specific group of membership? So that is value-based benefit design. Are we there yet? We are not. So I, I think there is a whole bunch of uh, activity that, uh, 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 that needs to come together. Uh, to get from where we are today in terms of using care gap from a regulatory perspective, a little bit on the value-based care side of things for provider engagement, to get to the final destination, which is personalized care. Uh, and I think that is the, uh, the evolution that uh, we will have to go through over the next uh, few years. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Rex, over to you. Yeah, I would, I would say... Um, there, there's there's a there's a phrase you know the the gapification of caps right where where um, there's a lot of movement around this where if you think of mm. care gaps and how we've how payers and providers have worked together over the past few years right you, you think of yeah mainly those HEDIS measures and medication adherence measures and you know measures where we we know a denominator we know who's being measured for that who has diabetes so they're in the diabetic denominator etc. Um, who's eligible for the breast cancer screening. So we, we know who, so it's easy to work with providers to, and to hold them accountable or to, to work with them and, and collaborate with them on this denominator and how to manage it and how to incent them to perform well on it, right? So um, that's historically been how we've, we've uh, you know, kind of handled care gaps. Now, what, what I'm seeing is a lot of movement towards taking those measures like the CAPS survey measures, right? So these are satisfaction and experience measures, um, asking members in a survey, a random survey of maybe just a few hundred people, no matter how big your plan is, you know, things like how satisfied are you, um, you know, on a, on a scale of zero to 10, how, how would you rate your health plan or your drug plan? Um, also, you know, how, essentially, how does your plan and provider work together to coordinate your care? Does your, does your, does your provider know about the other care that you're receiving from other providers? Um, how easy was it to schedule an appointment? We were able to get it as soon as you needed it, as soon as you needed care. Th things like that. that. Those are all measured in the CAP survey. They're all star ratings measures. And they have been largely ignored for a long time because there is no denominator. You don't know who's going to get the CAP survey. You don't know um, who's going to fill out the CAP survey if they get it. And then you don't know how they're going to answer. So you know, if you want to influence that, historically, you thought you had to influence your entire population. You know, that's, that's not the case. And we have now sophisticated health plans and sophisticated vendors working with these health plans from a predictive analytics standpoint to help plans understand who is most likely to, to respond to the survey if they get it, how are they likely to respond, who are the most important, you know, members um, when you think about that CAPS measure, and how... Um, how many members do you need to influence to move your CAPS measure up one or two points, which, you know, the thresholds for star ratings for a CAPS measure is very often just one point. You move from 84 to 85 and you jump from three to four stars, right? So um, it doesn't take a lot of members to influence for you to improve your score. So what plans are doing is they're, they're working with these predictive analytics teams to create denominators for these CAPS measures. And they are baking them into their provider incentive plan where they are now um, um, incenting providers to perform better at these CAP surveys. You know, there's a lot, there are a lot of mechanics to work out as far as how are you going to assess it and how are you going to, um, you know, really determine the score, but it is being done and it's making a difference. So, you know, when I think of where can payers and providers align better from a care gap standpoint, it's really around those um, historically non-care gaps that we are now turning into a care gap so that we can manage them and be much more effective at you know increasing the score than we ever were before because the weight the weight makes it to where we can't afford not to address these measures now and to work with providers who have the most influence over many of these measures as well. Thanks, Rex. You know, just a couple of thoughts come to my mind when I hear about this question. And it's, it, part of it is the basics. As our tools and as the data are much more complete and powerful 
in providing real-time information. Uh, one thing I would emphasize is the value and the importance of sharing the information, even better yet, the tools, access to the information through the tools with your providers with whom you've established value-based contracts. And we all know that provider systems are in different places in their ability to use information and their desire to use it. But where I found the most success, at least in my career, is working with providers up front, show the information, open up the kimono, make this less about the black box, and then work together to establish what should the key performance indicators be? What do we think really are the care gaps and why? And then even going as far as asking for input. And oftentimes, you know, we would bring in groups of providers from different systems to help us think through how to design the benefit plan design that will best bring about improvement in care. Always find that, you know, sharing the information and involving the provider systems in this typical health insurance uh, function uh, pays off uh, dramatically just in their, the way they work with your members. Uh, so um, uh, just another point of context. Moving on to the third one, um, and I'll go to you, Rex, first. But And we've touched on some of these, but if you've got some other examples of member-centric approaches for improving outcomes in uh, star ratings. And every C CFO loves to hear about this, I can assure you. <laughs> right. Um... Yeah, I think, you know, where, where I would where I would take the conversation is and part of it is kind of where we are in the timeline right now. Right. So, um, you know, these organizations are around the bid table right now making decisions for 2023. And I think, you know, there are opportunities to to uh, to in, in, increase the, you know, the member centric ability of, of our bid strategies. Right. I think very often I see you know, plans making decisions in the bid strategy room that are purely financial. And I realize, you know, there, the things have to be balanced, but there is, I think, too often not a voice of the member representative or, you know, it's in, in that decision, um, especially, you know, when we're facing hard choices like, like cost stewardship initiatives, right? And, um, new, new prior offs and um, where we're feeling like there's some abuse, you know, with uh, um, in the care being delivered or, or whatever that looks like. And we need to make a hard decision. And I'm not saying we don't make those decisions. We, we absolutely have to implement some of those things, but we need to understand better the, how it's going to impact the members. And, and then after the bid is set, like, I think a really important exercise to go through. Um, and, and I think it's, it's table stakes now. I think we can't afford not to do it now with uh, the, the change in weights and the focus on the member experience. But once the bid strategy is set, um, determine which members are impacted negatively by our bid changes, because there will inevitably be, be some, right? If we're um, changing side of care requirements or, or anything like that. I mean, I worked with a plan one time where, you know, we, made a key change to a home infusion therapy benefit and we were going to save tons of money because it was a it was being it just wasn't being uh it wasn't a, a very effective and very efficient benefit right so we we made a change but it required members to to have a very specific site of care or they had a huge out-of-pocket cost and we really needed to make sure that they understood that so you know we did not rely on the annual notice of change document to communicate that we we called every member that we thought was going to be impacted by it and it was a hard conversation because it was hey we need to really make sure you understand this benefit change to your plan and if you you know if you keep keep obtaining care like you are now you could see a twenty thousand dollar out of pocket cost next year and we don't want that to happen so here's what you need to do and the some of the members were upset some of the members filed grievances but the, the vast majority of members were very appreciative. I think they were all appreciative of it. Some of them were just upset because, you know, this change was, was disrupting them and causing them to have to do something differently. And I think a lot of plans shy away from that and say, you know, we don't, we don't want to stir the pot. We don't, we don't want to upset them. 
into may, maybe almost like pretending like it, it's not going to happen if we ignore it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, not that that's the conscious choice, but I think that's the unconscious choice that many of us make in those decision rooms. So I think, um, I think you know, number one, making bid changes based on our understanding of, of, of our members and who we want to attract, right? That, that are really relevant for those members. So if, if I'm a DSNP, a dual special needs plan, you know, I probably want a, a cash card, a food card, something like that that's going to be important for my, my members and it's going to attract them and make them feel seen, right? And make them want to be a, a member of my plan. So having the products and benefits that attract the people that you want, that you have and then that, that you want to attract is, is one thing. Uh, managing through that negative change for anyone who's, who's disrupted, like I mentioned, having an outreach strategy for all the members that are negatively impacted by the bid strategy. Um, that's another one that I mentioned. And then I think I would you know, also just say, when I think of contact, customer contact, right? Whether it's a member calling in for customer service or mm-hmm. me calling out to the member from an outreach standpoint for maybe a care gap closure or something, so for the for the outreach, there's always opportunity to to coordinate that, and much more so than we do today, typically, right? Um, whereas you know I've worked with plans and done assessments and realized, hey, this member got um, eight different outreaches in the same day from different either vendors or internal departments who didn't know the other ones were calling, didn't know that member was on their list. So that member got eight calls and was not happy. Um, so lots of opportunity to coordinate that you know, customer contact, but I think even more importantly, customer service. So when I think of stars and satisfaction with the plan and your experience with the plan and whether or not you're going to be retained or not as a, as a, as a member, um, so much of it comes back to the customer service experience. You know, yeah. it, they don't have to be, we don't have to elate every customer, <laughs> like every if we just meet their expectations, we don't have to exceed their expectations because their expectations are high because of the things they're getting from Amazon and right these other experiences that they're having. They have high expectations. Let's meet their expectations um, and, and don't require a whole lot of effort. So, so if they have a question and they need to reach out to customer service, let's don't make it hard. Let's don't make them have to wait you know, for 20 minutes on hold before they can get an answer because they will leave, even if they're happy. Happy people still leave, you know. Um, happy people are not necessarily always loyal people. You know, people that we make it easy for are the ones who stay. That's, that's who's loyal. So we need to make it easy for them. So when you think of member-centric approaches and things we can do, you know, we need to start with customer service, I think. Um, we need to make sure we have staffing, make sure... We have self-service uh, capabilities. Um, make sure members don't try to solve something on their own and then switch to, and then realize they can't, so they have to call customer service and they're, they're channel switching. So there's so much opportunity to improve that and make it less, to make it more effortless, right? And, yeah. and that's gonna that's gonna pay off in dividends. All great examples, Rex. Thanks, uh, Sean. Let's shift over to you on this one. Sure. Uh, so. Uh, I think uh, if I look at examples of member-centric approaches, uh, there are many, and I, it, we can talk at length about what are some of the things that works. But at its basic fundamental level, it boils down to understanding your members better. So if you have a million members or 5 million members or 25 million members, it's not one category. A, a, how many categories is entirely dependent on the kind of business that uh, you're running, whether it is commercial, Medicare, within that, what are the uh, differentiation that you want to look at. But uh, fundamental principle is you need to understand your members better and then deliver um, options, care, uh, outreach, uh, all of the stuff that Rex mentioned in a, uh, in a, uh, in a right fit, right alignment manner. So a text to a specific member may be responsive. Uh, an email may not be responsive, but uh, but it could be vice versa in uh, somebody else's case. Uh, so I don't respond to text as much as I respond to email. So uh, so it's it's what is the right fit for the right individual, and that's a very good example mm-hmm. that I. So how do you understand your membership better? Uh, uh, now, uh, obviously, uh, we spoke about data a little while. Uh, 
a bag. And having that data, data ecosystem is going to be really important for, uh, for health plans to be able to identify uh, and understand uh, your membership better. And then delivering uh, personalized solutions. This is what uh, you know, Rex mentioned, Amazon, Amazon, Netflix, maybe not to the extent of a Facebook or uh, that company, but uh, <laughs> partnering on invasiveness, but uh, uh, to a, uh, to a mid level where uh, you still understand your membership, uh, not just based off of clinical data and others, but you know, socioeconomic conditions and uh, uh, supplementary uh, requirements and uh, uh, similar uh, thoughts as well. And then delivering uh, 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 solutions, uh, be it clinical solutions, be it digital therapeutics, be it uh, uh, SAMD uh, kind of uh, uh, offerings or uh, smart devices or what have you, but tailoring it for your membership as need is, uh, I think, uh, what is going to be really important. Yeah. And, you know, we often hear about Amazon and, you know, every, every other retailer out there. Um, our industry is moving in that direction. So I think in order for any health plan or payer to remain competitive, you've got to build a strategy uh, and a long-term strategy, figure out where you're going to go after that. And listening to both of you guys, it reminds me of the subject of omni-channel member engagement. I remember the first time I heard that and I said, what the heck does omni-channel mean? But as I researched it more and understand it much better now, the power of that um, is of, of being in place and thoughtful is critical and not thinking through that is equally destructive for member uh, satisfaction. Maybe Randy, we can talk about that at some other point down the road. Okay, I'm gonna do this, it's 344. Let's go to the last slide. And what the question is here, what are some of the emerging technologies that help to um, service a member in this uh, so-called collaborative healthcare ecosystem? Rex and Sham, I'm gonna ask you to pick one. And then once we're done with that, let's open it up for questions uh, to the group that's been with us. So, uh, Sean, uh, let's uh, let's go to you. Sure. Uh, so, if I have to pick one, uh, so uh, don't pick the one I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this was the first question where Eric uh, gave me the opportunity to talk first. So, I, <laughs> I just have to you just need a back. That's answer. because you 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 answer questions so much more completely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. So. Uh, <laughs> So uh, let me, uh, so we spoke about Amazon and a couple of other examples from other industries that has worked and uh, agree, uh, Eric, I think that is where healthcare is wanting to get to. I'll, I'll give another example. And this is also an oft quoted example, which is Uber. And uh, 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 everybody uses Uber as an example on digital disruption, transformation, et cetera, that has happened to an industry. And the interesting fact is Uber started off as a transportation company. And today they're not just a transportation company, they do a whole a bunch of other suite of uh, 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 services for their member ecosystem. And that is what I think uh, uh, we all need to aspire to, which is uh, uh, how do you develop an ecosystem with your membership, with your consumer, with your community, so that you can be the channel through which multiple digital assets, multiple assets, clinical assets, digital assets, uh, supplementary benefits assets, what have you, can be delivered to that trusted community. Uh, I, there is another example that I picked up on uh, a YouTube channel some time back, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the app uh, that, um, uh, that books the most number of hotel, ticket, hotel bookings and uh, plane tickets in China was originally a grocery delivery app. Uh, and there is no connection between, uh, between the two industries, but the connection is the ecosystem or the membership that they transferred over. So uh, if, if I look at health plans, that is the aspirational uh, objective, which is if you have a million members and you know this is your uh, community consumer uh, uh, base that uh, you need to cater to, then you have to start delivering uh, uh, the entirety of uh, the, that community's requirement. 
and that is the aspirational level. There are many, many examples of uh, uh, the ecosystem play in different industries in different contexts. Uh, in, even in healthcare, uh, there is uh, there is uh, uh, bringing in together. Uh, I spoke about therapeutics as an example, virtual care, so on and so forth. But I think if I have to pick one, I would pick that. And then Rex, over to you. I'm sure you have a backup yeah. answer. All right, Rex. Not? That that was a good one, Sean. Rex, can you do them up here? Oh, I don't know if I can do them up. That was a good. One. <laughs> but I'll, uh, I'll I'll try. So yeah, yeah. So if I was picking one, um, and I would, this is not. Um, emerging, you know, from other industries standpoint, but I would say it is emerging in the healthcare um, ecosystem, right? Um, and I would say a voice of the customer platform. So a lot of this goes back to, you know, kind of everything I've talked about as far as the, 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 the importance of member experience being, you know, I, I think the most important thing that a, that a health plan is going to deal with right now. But you know, I see health plans who are really focused on this, you know, investing more in a uh, like a comprehensive voice of the, the, the member voice of the customer platform. And what this does, you know, it captures signals from across the ecosystem, Sig signals in, in basically three, three different fashions, right? So one being, one being, um, I didn't know if that was me or not. So I was like thinking, do I have, do I like something? Play? That means we're uh, coming to a close. No. Okay. 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 So, um, uh, but, but, but signals in three fashions. So, so one, um, gleaning, gleaning insights from, from the voice of the member feedback that we have in data, like grievances and complaints and appeals. Right. So all of that data that we have, like mining through it and, and capturing signals, mm -hmm. Um, that's one. Number two is solic solicited, you know, signals. So, so surveys, mock surveys, uh, net promoter score surveys, post call surveys, the whole nine yards of, of we ask a member, hey, how was that experience or how are you feeling today? What's, what's the sentiment of our membership? Um, and it captures all of that. And, and third is um, observed behavior, right? So where we're actually, um, anytime a member logs on to our website, through the portal and they are they're looking for a provider right and we are tracking every move they make we can we can watch on a video that entire experience and where their cursor went and, and where they struggled and where they um they couldn't do what they wanted to do or could they couldn't find the provider they're having some kind of difficulty so you know this platform takes all of the data that we have all of the solicited feedback that we that we have and then all of this observed behavior that we that we have and then it creates these actionable insights and then it sends them to role-based teams throughout the organization who have been trained to handle these issues immediately and where we resolve the issue we reach out to the customer we close the loop um, and we improve the experience right so i'm seeing like that that's happened in the airline industry and the hotel industry for for years right like they're so on top of this um, and now I'm seeing that more and more in the more progressive health plans that are more focused on, you know, tackling this, uh, this member experience issue. Yeah, absolutely. That was a good one. All right. Well, um, thanks, Rex and Sean both. Um, let's stop here, open it up for questions. Feel free to unmute. Uh, feel free to come on video if you're brave enough. And um, Stanley, first hand up. Hey, thank you. I always like to be first but um i just one comment and, and then i'll ask the question i was a little concerned about the approach um where you seem to be targeted the idea of targeting the members that go, are going to answer the cap survey and then focusing on them that that's almost like you know teaching to the test or whatever so i, I was a little concerned about that comment maybe i misunderstood but but um a little concerning, but my, my question is, where, where do you find the, in, in terms of providing tools, is, the, is it a better return on investment to bring, to give tools to the providers for managing care, for example, for diabetes or other conditions, or to bring tools directly to the member to help them manage their care? I was curious as to the, the back and forth between those two. Um, Rex, you wanna go on that or? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll start. And I'll take the, the first one because I think that was probably me that said that. Yeah, right? that's so, what I was thinking. 
yeah the and and and, and definitely there there are there are there are two things we're doing right so we're we're understanding who's who's most likely to respond to the survey and then we're understanding who's not and, and within both of those segments we're understanding basically who's who's happy and who's not who's who's satisfied who's not, who's had a good experience who's, who is most likely to respond in certain ways the ones that are that are that are satisfied who are and there are different strategies for all these segments right the ones who we think will score well and who are most likely to respond to the survey or, or actually the ones that we don't think are going to respond to the survey but we think they're positive we it's like a it's like a get out to vote campaign right we want we want them to vote we want that that's how that's how we preach it right in the, in the plans is that's our strategy we we want to campaign to those people to get them out to vote if you get the survey please fill it out and, and there's a lot there are a lot of rules we have to abide by we have to kind of say the same thing to everyone but we can say it in different channels or different methods right where um and this is just part of the rules right where i can send one person um, a message on a bright, colorful infograph, and I can send someone else a black and white postcard with the exact same words on it, but much less likely to to uh, um, or basically saying, you know, please respond to the survey if you get it. These are just strategies. You know, we can we can debate the uh, <laughs> the uh, you know um, the gray areas in there, but these are strategies that are definitely deployed across across the industry, and they're they're within the rules that we that we have. Um, Second, so and then to the second part of your question, you know, I, it's it's difficult, right? I could argue either way, but I probably, if I had to pick one, I would, I think I would say the provider just because I think, you know, there's so much trust there and so much importance that needs to be placed in, and, and when the provider says something typically, and maybe it's changing a little bit, but, you know, they typically listen to them more than the plan. Not that we don't want to equip members. I think if, I think you, you want to do both, right? Because, I think you absolutely want to equip members with those devices and those tools as well. But if I had to pick one, I would probably do the provider because I think their their word carries weight and I think would would be influential and I think they would hopefully target their whole panel. But that's Sean, what do you think? Uh, so uh, slightly different opinion. I think uh, the answer to Stanley's question is it depends. Uh, <laughs> Are you a consultant? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, but uh, let me give you two examples. It's one uh, a very uh, uh, corporate example, another one uh, a little bit of a personal example. Um, uh, uh, there is, and we spoke about other industries as well. So uh, there is this notion of B two C two B in terms of tools and technologies. So a great example is uh, Slack. You know, it's a productivity tool. Now, Slack was given to consumers first. And then because of adoption amongst consumers, it was then rolled up and uh, then packaged and sold to enterprises to be delivered to all of their employees uh, because the adoption within the employee base was already there. So there are technologies and there would be solutions, clinical solutions, et cetera, that can be given a wellness app, for example. There are, there are 25,000 wellness apps that are out there, but the adoption would be four or five. Now, if a health plan or a provider organization wants to understand their member better, then they could pick and choose one of those wellness apps to partner with because there is already adoption in their member base. A second provider or a second payer would uh, may pick a different wellness app because the adoption may be different over there. So I think there is value in direct to member because that is that is where you're trying to get to. Uh, there is also, so for, I'll give you a different example. Clinical- uh, You know what, Sean? Uh, let me just see if there's other questions before we give sure. one more example. Is that sound all right? Thanks. Any, any other questions? Um, raise your hand or open up, just jump in. Yeah, hello, uh, Eric. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, you know, ahead. quite a bit uh, about the Medicare population and star ratings, and you know that that population has you know more acute conditions. They could have hip replacement, you know, knee surgeries, and physical therapy is so important, and taking the drugs and exercising and all. What are we doing? Uh, what are what are your thoughts on patient adherence and making that a, a stronger so that your ratings are uh, reflect that. Rex? 
So in, inherent. So um, how do we get them to to adhere to those regimens more? So yes. the scores go up. Yes. Yeah, I think you know I, a lot of the discussions that I'm in, at least, are you know around this. Um, I don't know if this hopefully this answers your question, but you know this uh, this care team approach. Um, that's a, a a huge topic that I know a lot of plans are working with their key provider partners to to implement. But but basically, um, you know where we're um, expanding the influence of of different providers, but but on one team. So making sure we're we're working with members to um, to address all of their needs, right. And to, to tackle all of their needs around social determinants of health, right. Health equity through, uh, um, through a, a social worker, as well as the PCP and nurse practitioner and pharmacist and all working together to address all of the needs so that adherence and compliance do, do go up. And, you know, I've seen some great results when provider clinics have implemented something like that. They're typically, you know, top of the game in, in the, in the five-star world. Um, but Sean, what would you, what would you say? No, I think uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, before Eric pulls me up again, <laughs> I, uh, so Rex, uh, great point. I don't, I think I have anything else to add. Hey, Ed, uh, just thinking back on my healthcare delivery days, certainly uh, patient adherence, patient compliance is probably the number one, certainly top three source of frustration, especially in the primary care model. And where I would go is back to a comment I made earlier. In fact, we did do this with our physician advisory groups. And we spoke, we would have meetings specifically on this subject, understand the points of frustration, and then figure out how we can factor that into a variety of uh, of uh, you know uh, tactics through member communication. Now with the uh, digital um, tools that are out there, you can have more time, uh, more real time solution opportunities. But absolutely, sitting down provider and payer together and making sure the providers have an opportunity to express where their sources of challenge are. It's only going to help us with the stars too. Thank you. A very basic response but uh, very important, Ed, thanks for the question. Others? Thank you. It, um, oh, work, yes. You were time, Eric, but thank you so much. This has been so enlightening and you've made uh, the Emerging Technologies Subwork Group look awesome. Okay. We appreciate your professionalism and your, your perspective. It was great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, we are at the top of the hour and um, everyone wants to end a meeting on time. Let me just extend my thanks uh, to Rex and Sham for joining us today. You guys are great. The perspectives you bring, very important. And to Weedy um, and Randy uh, Swift, uh, thank you so much for letting us be a part of this great organization for what you all do. And um, certainly if anyone wants to follow up with either or any of us, uh, Randy Swift has our name, rank, and serial number, and we'll be glad to help you out however we can. So with that, enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Rex and Sean, thank you again. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We're great. Bye-bye. Bye now.